New Year. Uh, did anyone stay up till midnight? A few. Who, went, who got an early night to bed? I did. <laughs> it was wonderful. Uh, it is great to have you with us. Uh, we're going to look at that psalm in a moment, but before we do, uh, let me pray for us. Uh, Heavenly Father, everlasting God, uh, we thank you, we praise you for another year. Uh, we thank you that while we are changing, you are not. Uh, you're faithful, you are sure, uh, you're the same yesterday, today and forever. Uh, and Father, we are fleeting, our lives are short. And yet you delight to speak words of life to us. Uh, you speak grace into our lives, and so we pray, do it again. Uh, do it today. Uh, speak a word of life and joy into our hearts this morning. Uh, help us to receive it with thanksgiving. Uh, amen. Well, before we get into that psalm, I want to start by noticing a couple of things that happen around this time of year. Uh, the first is that many of us start to reflect on our lives and so we ask questions like, what did I actually do last year? Um, what were the highs? Uh, what were the lows? Um, what were the kinds of things I did last year? Was I happy with the kind of way that I lived? Uh, and then we also start to look forward. And we ask, you know, what do I want to do next year? What are the goals that I want to accomplish? Where am I going? Um, how do I want to do things differently and for some of us, we realize, actually, maybe I haven't been living the way that I want to be. Uh, and so the other thing that happens is that this time of the year, it's the big opportunity for change. Uh, it's the opportunity to uh, redesign the habits of our life. And so uh, there's New Year's resolutions where we say, I am going to make a change. And sometimes it sticks and sometimes it doesn't. Uh, this is the kind of reflection that is actually going on in Psalm 90. Uh, you'll notice, uh, if you've got a Bible there, the heading of this psalm describes it as a prayer of Moses. Uh, it means this psalm was probably written sometime in the mid-1000s BC, three and a half thousand years ago. Uh, this psalm is really a reflection prompted by the passing of years and the passing of days. Um, at a top level, in this psalm, the words day and year are mentioned six times each, uh, which is more than any other psalm. Uh, so it's appropriate to look at it on New Year's Day, which is the passing of another year. Uh, so I want to invite you, come reflect with the psalmist Moses. Uh, he has two basic reflections for us in this psalm. Uh, the first is that life is brief. Life is brief. It's short. But the second is that although life is brief, it can be beautiful. It can be beautiful. So today we're just going to unpack each of those ideas, explore what they might mean for our lives. Now the first is that life is brief. Uh, I mean, we can see it pretty clearly there in verse 10. He, sa he says, Our days may come to 70 years or 80, if our strength endures. Yet the best of them are but trouble and sorrow for, why? for they quickly pass and we fly away. Uh, the point is simply that our years, however many they may be, they pass quickly and we fly away. But Moses also knows that we don't often believe this. Actually, we often end up believing quite the opposite, that our lives will kind of just keep going on and on, uh, that we have all the time in the world. Uh, and so what Moses does in the first part of the psalm, he compares God's time to our time to show us how short our lives really are. So you can see that verse 1. He starts, Lord, you have been our dwelling place throughout all generations. Before the mountains were born, or you brought forth the whole world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Uh, the point is that God is immortal. He is unchanging. In the words of Hebrews 13, he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. But it's important to know why Moses is making this point. Um, the whole point of actually stressing the immortality of God is actually to remind us of our mortality. And so in the next verse, he says, You turn people back to dust, saying, Return to dust, you mortals. Uh, what's the point? Compared to the 
immortal, eternal, unchanging, everlasting God, we are so wildly insignificant. We are here one second, gone the next. Uh, But then Moses, he really lands the punch with a little poem about what a thousand years are like to God. Uh, And he says this, A thousand years in your sight are like a day that has just gone by, or like a watch in the night. Can you see what Moses is doing here? He's trying to put our lives into perspective by explaining what a thousand years are like to God. And his point is, is that a thousand years, well, to God, it's just like it was yesterday. Uh, Moses, he actually goes further uh, and says that a thousand years are actually like a watch in the night. Uh, That's a four-hour period. Uh, These verses are basically the ancient equivalent of one of those zoom-out videos of the universe. You know those ones? Starts with Earth or something like that. Other planets, sun, solar system galaxy, and it just keeps going. The point is, we are tiny. Uh, Well, Moses, he is doing a similar thing. If a thousand years, a millennium, are like nothing more than four hours to God, then what on earth is our life? 70, 80 years? It is nothing. It is a flash in the pan. Here one second, gone the next. We are a tiny blip in the history of reality. Uh, Moses says we are like grass. Here one day, gone the next. He says in the next verses, uh, yet you sweep people away in the sleep of death. They are like the new grass of the morning. In the morning it springs up new, but by evening it is dry and withered. We are like grass. Uh, My family uh, we, uh, we moved into a new place recently, and uh, the previous guy there wasn't much of a gardener, because uh, the backyard, it was basically just a field of dandelions. Um, those yellow flowers, they've got those fluffy seeds that our kids have blown, um, which actually makes the problem worse, because then the seeds go everywhere and we get more. Um, what I didn't realise, um, it kind of shocked me, is that each day in the morning, those yellow flowers open up, and they're open for the day, and it's like this sea of gold. Uh, But then when night comes, they actually close up and the flowers are hidden away. Uh, Psalm 90 says that that's a bit like us. Um, We open up, we bloom for a time, but not long after our time is done and we close up, returning to the ground. Um, To speak honestly for a moment, uh, this is one of the lessons that my son Levi taught me. Um, He lived for four days. Uh, By anyone's standards, that is a very short life. Um, As he died, it was actually my life that felt very, very short. Um, I remember, um, it's almost as simply, it's like I had a day's work to do, and then I too would fall asleep. Um, My life felt very, very short. Um, Moses is making a simple point. Life is short. And we all die. And so that raises a question. Why? Why? Why do I have to die? And why so soon? Uh, Moses, he gives us the uncomfortable answer in the next verses. He says, We are consumed by your anger and terrified by your indignation. You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your presence. All our days pass away under your wrath. We finish our years with a moan. Life is short because God is angry. And God is angry because of our sin. Uh, The brevity of our lives is a result of our wrongdoing and God's wrath. Um, It's worth clarifying that these verses aren't so much talking about a specific punishment in response to specific sins that we as individuals have committed. And it's talking about a general punishment upon all humans in general in response to our collective sin. This is the way we are now. Uh, Although God sometimes does punish specific individuals. Um, 
Now, uh, the reason we know this, that this is a general thing, is because Moses includes a reference back to Genesis 3. Um, So have a look. Verse 3, he says this. He says, you turn people back to dust, saying, return to dust, you mortals. Um, Compare that with Genesis 3.19. God says this to Adam and Eve. Dust you are, and to dust you will return. And by pointing us back to the original sin of Adam and Eve, uh, Moses is making the point that our mortality, the shortness of our lives, is a direct result of God's judgment in response to all of our sin. But why does this matter? Like, why is it important for us to know this point about our sin and God's judgment? Uh, There are a whole heap of reasons. I want to highlight one in particular. I think it's a reason we need to hear as modern 21st century uh, people. The point is simply this, that there is nothing we can do to solve the problem of dying after such a short time. Uh, It's not a technological problem. It's not a medical problem. It's not an educational problem. It's not an economic problem. It's a problem caused by our sin and God's judgment, which means there's nothing we can do to solve this problem without first dealing with the problems of our sin and God's judgment. See, there is a modern misconception that people in the ancient world, they died far younger than us. Uh, And so we often think that over the centuries, we have, through technological, medical advancements, have dramatically extended our lifespan. You know, we're overcoming this problem. Uh, We often imagine, you know, the ancient Roman, the ancient Greek, they would, you know, if you get to 40, oh, you're an old man. Um, Now, they they would have looked at us and go, you guys, you live to like 70, 80? Shocked. That's not entirely true. Have a look at what Moses says in verse 10 of this psalm. Our days may come to 70 years or 80, if our strength endures, yet the best of them are but trouble and sorrow, for they quickly pass and we fly away. Did you catch that? Writing three and a half thousand years ago, Moses thought it was entirely normal for us to live to 70 years or 80, if we're strong. Yeah? That has basically remained true for like the last at least three and a half thousand years. Um, there's an article in the Journal of the Royal Society of Medicine. It looked at average lifespans of people recorded in various dictionaries. Um, this is what they found. First century BC, the median age was 72. Uh, between 1850 and 1945, the median age dropped by one to 71. Uh, the average lifespan of someone living in the US today is 77. It is true that our average life expectancy has increased over the centuries, but that's not because we're living any longer. Uh, That's simply because more of us are making it to old age. That's mostly due to infant survival rates. Once we get to old age, basically the same thing happens to us all. That's been happening for thousands and thousands of years. Uh, Here's the point. Despite all our technological, medical and economic advancements, verse 10 of this psalm has basically just remained true for at least the last three and a half thousand years. Life is short, full of trouble, and there isn't much we can do about it. Uh, The poet T.S. Eliot, he was someone who reflected on these uncomfortable realities. Uh, 1925, he wrote a poem called The Hollow Men. Uh, He says, we are the hollow men, we are the stuffed men. Uh, And then he finishes the poem like this. This is the way the world ends. This is the way the world ends. This is the way the world ends. Not with a bang, but a whimper. Which is actually something quite similar to something that Moses said three and a half thousand years earlier. Moses said, all our days pass away under your wrath. We finish our years with a moan. Or in the ESV, a sigh. Life is short and full of trouble. But it's not all doom and gloom. Because Moses goes on to say that despite the fact that life is brief, it can be beautiful. It can be filled with 
joy, satisfaction, gladness. That's what he says in the next verses. So what's the secret? How do you live in such a way that draws out the beauty of life? He tells us in verse 12, this is really the big takeaway. This is the big thing in the psalm. Teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Teach us to number our days. Uh, What does that mean? It means to live like life is short. If someone says, my days are numbered, what they mean is time is short. They're running out of time. And so to number our days means to live like life is short. And if we do this, we will gain a heart of wisdom. It is wise to live like time is short. Or to say it the other way around, if we live like life is long, as if it'll just go on and on, then that is foolish. It's unwise. Now, what does it mean to live like life is short? Well, just imagine with me for a moment you've been unwell. Um, You go to the doctor, they run some tests, the tests come back, the doctor calls you in. They say, look, it's not looking good, you don't have much time. What do you do? What would you do? My hunch is that most of us would go one of two ways. The first way we we might go would be to spend our days living in the moment, you know, trying to live in the now. Why? Because... We'll be gone soon, and so you better enjoy it while you can. And so you pack your bags, you travel the world, you seek out new experiences, all with your loved ones around you. You try to live in the moment. But the other way we could go would be to try and build a legacy. Try and build something for the next generation, something we'll be remembered for. Why? Because I'll be gone soon. So I have to build something that will last into future generations. So you start a charity, a foundation, you try and make a difference. So there's the two ways we could go, living in the moment or trying to build a legacy. Uh, Two ways of living when our days are numbered. And what the Bible says, and actually what this passage says, is that both of these are actually half right. There's actually something really beautiful about each of them. They're half right, but they're actually missing something crucial And without it, they're ultimately hollow. So, how do we fix them? Think with me about living in the moment. The problem with that, uh, this way of living, living in the now, is that while it might provide a level of enjoyment for a time, it ultimately doesn't last. Because once the moment finishes, you need another moment. Uh, Often it needs to be bigger and better. And so we book the next holiday. We try and find the next moment but we still feel restless. Why? Because there is nothing in this world that can bear the weight of our satisfaction. Nothing can deliver the lasting satisfaction that we're actually searching for. And actually, by placing all of our expectation on this moment, we actually crush it by expecting too much of it. So what's missing? What do we need to do to... make this way of living work. Uh, Remember, it is half right. Moses tells us in verses 14 to 15, he says, Satisfy us in the morning with your unfailing love, that we may sing for joy and be glad all our days. Make us glad for as many days as you have afflicted us, for as many years as we have seen trouble. What's the secret? It's the love of God. It is his unfailing love. Because God can bear the weight of your satisfaction. He can deliver. He can satisfy. It's a prayer. Satisfy us in the morning. Um, Augustine famously said, Our hearts are restless until they find their rest in thee. Uh, And notice that this satisfaction, joy, it keeps coming back to deliver. Uh, It is in the morning. It is every single day, all our days, every moment. But this doesn't stop us from enjoying the world around us. It's actually the opposite. Um, Finding your joy in God actually frees you to enjoy the moments and the world around you because you can simply enjoy them for what they are. 
You're not expecting them to be all satisfying to solve all your problems. You can just simply go on a holiday overseas, enjoy it for what it is, a nice time away, and it'll probably be a bit stressful too, not expecting it to solve all your problems because God can do that. Can you see how when you have the love of God in your life, it actually frees you to live in the moment, to enjoy things for what they are, knowing that you're already satisfied in Him. That's the first way of living like time is short. The second way is by building a legacy. The problem with that way of living is that nothing actually lasts. Um, How many of us know the names of our great-grandparents, let alone our great-great-grandparents, or anything about them, and we're their family? Uh, We are far more insignificant than we really think we are. So what do we need to make this way of living work? What's the missing piece? Uh, It's there in verses 16 and 17. May your deeds be shown to your servants, your splendor to their children. May the favor of the Lord our God rest on us. Establish the work of our hands for us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. Um, When I first read these verses, I actually misread them. Um, In verse 16, it says, May your deeds be shown to your servants. But when I read the next verse, what I thought it said was, establish the work of your hands for us. Yes, establish the work of your hands. But that's not what it says. It says, establish the work of our hands for us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. Um, The Hebrew word there for establish means to make something permanent to make it lasting, which means there is a way for us to build a legacy, so to speak. Um, We can build something that will last, and the secret is the relationship between God's deeds and the work of our hands. Did you notice that it flips from talking about God's deeds, show us, to talking about the work of our hands? It's almost like a father teaching a son the family trade. Teach me your work. That's the secret. When the work of our hands is modelled off and mimics the work of our Father, that's when we can build something that will last. And what's God building? His kingdom. Uh, He's calling people from darkness into His kingdom of glorious light. And when we become co-laborers with Him... When the work of our hands is modelled off our fathers, uh, we can actually do something that will last. So what, what is it that lasts into the new creation? What goes beyond death? People. People. See, when Jesus rose from the dead, he made it possible for people like you and me to rise with him into eternal life. See, only Jesus can take away our sin and God's judgment. That's what he came to do. Nothing else can do that. And when we labor for his kingdom, seeing people become and grow as followers of Jesus, we are building something that will last. People. So what's the application of this passage? It's basically verse 12. Be taught to number your days. Live like life is short, because it is. Let me close by telling you about Jonathan Edwards. Uh, He was a pastor. He was a theologian in the 1700s. Um, As a teenager, he started writing a bunch of resolutions. Um, He did that. He would look at them each week, which actually is a good habit if you want to achieve a goal. Uh, But I want to close by sharing the seventh of his 70 resolutions. He says this, Resolved never to do anything which I would be afraid to do if it were the last hour of my life. Does that mean constantly living in a state of crisis? No. What it does mean is constantly living in light of the reality that life is brief. But it can be beautiful, um, leading both to enjoy every moment with our Heavenly Father, every morning, and to build something that will last. Would you pray with me? Pray that these things will be true for us. 
Heavenly Father, we confess and acknowledge that we are weak, we are frail, um, we are sinful. But we confess that um, knowing that you have made a way in Jesus to experience your love, your love, your unfailing love, um, eternal life. Uh, Teach us, Lord, to number our days. Give us a heart of wisdom. Satisfy us with your unfailing love. Um, Establish the work of our hands, we pray. Lord, do that. Um, We pray it for your glory, and we pray it in the name of Jesus. Amen.